I'm Barbara Josie. I'm a children's author. I've written 55 books for children that are now in 29 different languages. So you'll find copies of some of my books across the whole world. And that makes me so happy because I'm, I'm really delighted to think that I write for audiences everywhere. And I take a little bit of our country wherever my books are seen. My newest book is called The Fisherman, the Horse and the Sea, published by Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And I love working with the press. They have such important books and it's just been a delight to work with them. And my best friend, Renee Grave, who is the illustrator of that book. So let's start the PowerPoint and I'll explain a little bit of how I wrote what I did and then read the story. Okay, The Fisherman, the Horse and the Sea. First, we're gonna talk about the creative team. And that will be the author, that's me, the illustrator, my best friend, Renee Grafe, and the publisher, Wisconsin Historical Society Press. The publisher, of course, is not a person. The publisher is a whole bunch of people. The editor, the art director, the production manager, marketing team, so many people. It takes about three years to complete a book like this. So in the first year, I have an idea. It may have been percolating for one or two years before I begin what we call year one. So I'm thinking about it. Then I start to research because this is historical. It needs to be accurate, as accurate as we know. So I begin to do the research and that will take a little bit more than a year. Then I begin to write. Um, if I'm gonna count the number of times I write a book, it's probably around 500 times. Write and revise, write and revise. It's a long period. So that completes that year. However, this is not the only book I'm writing in a year. I might have two or three other projects that I'm working on. In the second year, I'm continuing to write and revise. And somewhere into that year, the illustrator uh, begins to work on the book. But now we're really working together. In this case, the illustrator Renee and I, as we are best friends, we, we talk almost every day and we plan every aspect of the book together. So even though I'm researching and writing in the first year, you don't see her name there, but she's, I'm talking to her and I'm saying, how does this feel to you? What do you think you could do for an image for this? How do you think the pacing will be? Now, the second half of that year is more condensed for the illustrator. So she's doing the thumbnails, the sketches and revisions, and it takes about six months for her full time to complete that. In the third year, we're kind of all working together. So now the publisher is very active in helping to edit and design and print the book and market the book. So all together, about three years to do the book. Okay, next one. So this is the author's job, that would be me. Everyone has a support team and my husband Chuck is mine. He does so many things to help make my work a little bit easier. He drives me around because I'm a terrible driver. He does all kinds of wonderful things. And I also have another support staff and that is Booker, my dog. He, uh, it, he more gives me comic relief, I would say, than anything. <laughs> He's about one year old, a Bernadoodle, and I love him to pieces. I've written 55 books for children. Most of them are picture books, but some are chapter books, and they are in 29 different languages. I began writing here, which is now only a half a block from my home at Ozaki Press, I had worked at Grafton State Bank because my dad worked at that bank and I got a job there in high school, but I'm really, really, really bad with numbers. And so it was a total failure. It was awful, so awful that they assigned me the job of being bank librarian. There is no such real thing as bank librarian. So I knew I just had to stay out of their hair and finish that summer. So the next summer, my family agreed I could get another kind of job. And I said, I wanted to write. So I got a job at the press. 
and Bill Shannon, who was the son of a son of a newspaper man. He was my editor and I will love him for the rest of my life because he had the same love of words and understanding that words were really powerful and he was a wonderful mentor and now a friend. So I dedicated this book to Bill Shannon III, my first editor, You Started a Fire That Will Not Die. Now the illustrator, Renee Grafe. Renee and I are best friends. We are silly, we laugh, we have strong opinions which we express freely and we always come up with something better than either one of us could have imagined by ourselves. It's a perfect uh, work partner for me. Although Renee doesn't do all of my books, um, she illustrates, she, I think we've done seven or eight together now. And in our work, we meet some really interesting people. Some are really important people like the mayor of Milwaukee, here he is, and I, we love him very much. And sometimes they're just really kind of interesting people like the Polka Kings who were featured in Lulu and Rocky in Milwaukee. And they were, they were so much fun. Okay, 15. Renee and I have done a series of travel books together featuring Lulu and Rocky, including Lulu and Rocky in Milwaukee. And we have together done the book called Everybody's Tree. That book has been very successful. That one was published last year. Well, part of the team is the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And we have a close friendship with Kate, who is the publisher of the press. And here we are exploring Door County because the next book we're doing together is Death's Door. And we were exploring Death's Door together last summer. Hatching ideas. How do I get ideas? I live in this place. I call it the crow's nest and it overlooks the town of Port Washington. From up there, I have a bird's eye view of everything that's going on in this little town. I keep my eye on everything and everything gives me ideas. The sky. I see the sky out of my big windows and the sky is ever changing and ever interesting. And it somehow gives me hope. So all my stories, and I think it's the job of every children's writer to have hope in their story. And this, there's nothing like the sky to give you hope. And this is where I've learned to love Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan, I found, has strong, strong stories. The communities along the lake have big stories. It's less about profit and loss and more about life and death. You cannot believe the power of the waves and the mystery of the lake. So I watch the lake in all its moods. I walk along the lake almost every day. This is a picture of the steam that comes off the lake or the fog. This is fog, I think, but sometimes the steam comes off the lake. Oh, you'll see one of those pictures on 24. Let's look at that one. As cold as the lake is, on the coldest days of winter, it steams. You just can't believe it. This is a day that's about 30 below zero. And look at the fishermen because there's a little effluence from Wisconsin Energy. And so the water is a bit warmer at Fisherman's Park. So the fishermen are always there on the coldest days because the fish are drawn to the slightly warmer water. So there's good, good fishing on a day like that. There are huge storms, huge storms in the lake with waves so high and so furious and they come up suddenly. Knowing that makes me understand that the lake can change its mood in one second. And that's part of the danger of the lake. A story often begins for me when I wake up, I've given up on an idea and I think this is not gonna be a story. But then I wake up a year later with an idea of a way to write the story and often the first few lines. And these are the lines that came to me when I woke up one day. Lester was the son of a son of a fisherman. He knew Lake Michigan can be soft as a kitten one day and terrible as a sea monster the next. That's because in a place like this, Port Washington, everybody is the son of a son of something, son of a son of a newspaperman, of a fisherman, 
of a banker. Things run in families in towns like this. And also we learn that the lake can be beautiful and beguiling and innocent looking and seeming soft as a kitten. And then it can change its mood and be dangerous, terrible as a sea monster. So that those two lines set this tone for the whole story. Take a look at that fisherman and now look at the fisherman that is in the iconic image for Smith Brothers fish shanty. The artist Renee chose to create an illustration of the fisherman that looks like this iconic image from Smith Brothers. There's another picture of the image of the fisherman with the fish. Okay, now research. I'm on the board of the Port Washington Historical Society. And Jackie, my friend, has helped me uncover all kinds of information uh, for the books that I write. And she's helped me get in touch with the Smith family who are featured in the story and find as many, as much information about the story that I'm writing as is possible to find. She also put me in touch with L Lloyd Smith. Here's Lloyd. He's in a nursing home and I interviewed Lloyd to get the details of his family and some of the story because when you read about a story that was many, many years ago, newspapers were different. They were more about telling a tall tale than they were about getting the facts straight. But Lloyd knew the facts because it was his family. So he helped me and after I interviewed him a few times, I would always send him um, copies of my notes from the interview and in his little spidery script, he'd write what, you know, additions or what was wrong. And um, then COVID hit and I couldn't see Lloyd anymore. And unfortunately he died before the book was out. And that makes me very sad. Here is Lloyd's father or grandfather, DeLoss Smith. He is one of the Smith brothers. He is Papa in the story, and I love this picture of him. <laughs> okay, next one. Here he is standing in front of the Smith Brothers um, original fish enterprise. And you'll notice something called Rupert Brand. Uh, that's a sign on the door on the, over the window. We'll talk about Rupert in a minute. And here is DeLoss Smith fishing. I think he never stopped fishing, never. This is Lester in the story and his little sister, Evelyn. And uh, one of their cousins is the little blondie. And Renee really tried to make these, the characters in the story look like the real children. So she was very excited to see this photograph of Lester, Evelyn and their dog, who it looks like a Bernese mountain dog. Then she thought, okay, it's factual to have a dog in a story. And she really likes to have dogs in stories because for one thing, she likes dogs, but for another, they create a curve. So you take the human characters and you end on the floor where the dog is and it creates a pleasing design for the eye. And so there is the family, including the dog, which we now know is real. I really wanted to show children working and not just playing. So here's Evelyn and Lester um, peeling potatoes for supper. And this is Lester as a grown man fishing. And here is Lester with his daughter and Rupert. And it says, Rupert is the fish smoker and lived with Dela Smith, Papa, family on Milwaukee Street in Port Washington. So now we know who Rupert is, a fish smoker. And here it says Rupert Fish Smoker. And the image of the fisherman on the iconic Smith Brothers sign, there is a bit of debate on this, but many people say it is Rupert. And if you look at his outfit, you sort of get, okay, that could be true, but we don't know that for sure. The horse. In the beginning, I didn't think I could tell this story because I, there was, really wasn't much about the horse itself. I thought at first, that it was called Frank the Horse, but th the name was not Frank of the horse. It was owned, the horse was owned by the Frank family. So we knew very little. When 
I looked into it, I thought of a way to write the story where the protagonist shared its spot with three different th people. And so it was the horse, the fisherman, and the sea, not just the horse. That allowed me to tell the story. My husband is a bronze sculptor. He did not create this sculpt sculpture, but he owns it. And we use that as the model for the horse in the book. And this is the Smith family fishing. And it entertains me to see the guys comfortable in their, in their fishing clothes and the women are still in dresses with skinny little waists who I don't know how they could breathe with those waists, but they were supposedly at least out for the ride, although I don't see any poles for them. Women's roles were really different then. And it's important to know that. I wanted it to be different, but uh, Lloyd said, no, this is what women did. Women cleaned and took care of the house and that was it. But Evelyn, the little sister, completely changed gender roles. And I was so excited to find out about Evelyn. So I'm going to read you a little bit of the back matter about Evelyn. Evelyn Smith was three years old in 1895 when this story took place. When she grew up, she did not let gender roles determine her life's path. Evelyn had a talent for business. She created the Smith Brothers Fish Sandwich, which became so popular, she later developed the family's successful restaurant, the Smith Brothers Fish Shanty. She also discovered a way to turn fish oil into an inexpensive source of vitamins that helped people during the Great Depression. In addition, she became the first industrial nurse in Milwaukee, served in a MASH unit in France during World War I, homesteaded in Montana, became active in women's rights in Milwaukee, and founded a tuberculosis sanitarium and children's camp. So I was able to show that during, in 1895, women's roles were, were pretty much determined, but that a generation later, those roles became broken with Evelyn and all that she did in her life. The art process. This is a picture of a sketch and then the final illustration. In this case, the sketch and final are not so different, but in some cases they're quite a bit different. And here is Lester from the sketch and the illustrator was able to take the photographs of Lester, luckily facing in the right direction with the shadow on the correct side of his face for this illustration and Evelyn, so she could use them as reference in drawing Lester. She used photographs of art she found online of terrible storms, and she used those as reference when she created the uh, illustration of the storm. And here's the final illustration. And now we'll tell the story. Fisherman, the horse, and the sea. Lester was the son of a son of a fisherman. He knew Lake Michigan could be soft as a kitten one day and terrible as a sea monster the next. Then we have a wonderful map. On sunny summer days, the lake spilled over with joy, washing to the sand with cool, foamy fingers while the sun cast jewels across the water. On those days, Lester collected driftwood branches, stacking them into a tent on the sand and playing with Evelyn inside. Sometimes he waited with Mama till the water reached his waist. They never waited further though, and Lester never waited alone. Evelyn wasn't allowed to go into the lake at all, even holding Mama's hand. She was too little. Okay. On other days, the sky grew green and bruised and the sea snarled. The gulls didn't fly and the ducks huddled to shore. Then Mama twisted her ring this way and that, worrying over Papa and Uncle Herbert out on the water. On those days, Mama did the thing she always did built a toasty fire in the stove, set out dough to rise and made stew. But she never lost sight of the lake, not for one second, not till she spied their speck of a boat on the water. Then she sent for the Frank horse, a fisherman's horse who loved the water. The big bay coach horse 
pulled the flat bottom boat to shore, depositing the two fishermen safe and sound. Soon, Papa and Uncle Herbert filled the doorway. Lester and Evelyn rushed into big arms, pressing their noses into woolen sweaters that smelled of the men, the fish, and the sea. The autumn, of Aqu uh, autumn equinox of 1895 was a day when Mama worried. On the equinox, the day is exactly as long as the night. For landsmen, it's a time of harvesting crops, pressing apples into cider and gazing at the moon. But for seamen, it's a time of worry. They believe wicked storms are brewed when the sun crosses the equator. That night, the wind shook the little house at Sucker Brook, shook it to the rafters. The roar of the breakers kept everyone awake except for Le Lester and Evelyn. They slept soundly, knowing Papa and Uncle Herbert were safe at home. The grown-ups huddled at the rough scrub table, drinking strong coffee. Papa thought he heard voices on the lake calling for help, but it was dark as a fish belly outside, too dark to see, and so they waited. At first dawn, Mama, Papa, and Uncle Herbert gathered on the beach and peered into the dim light. There, on the lake, a schooner in trouble. The Mary Ludwig had lost a mast and her sails were ripped to shreds. The crewmen had thrown out an anchor so the boat stayed put, but it was taking on water. Mama drew in her breath. Were the men trying to escape the Mary Ludwig by launching a small rowboat into the horrible storm? They would never survive. Mama untied her apron and Papa fastened it to an oar. He waved it back and forth to warn the crewmen a red signal of danger. Inside, Lester woke with a start. Something felt wrong. He didn't hear footsteps in the kitchen or the sizzle of bacon in a fry pan. Where was Mama in her red apron? Where were Uncle Herbert and Papa? From the window, Lester spied Papa on the beach waving the oar with its apron flag, and he knew something terrible was happening on the lake. He wanted to see for himself. He wanted to be with them. Lester rushed to the beach and huddled with his family as they watched the two crewmen crawl into their small rowboat. The boat rode a breaker up and up, then slid out of sight, then appeared again, impossibly small, on the swell of a mountainous wave. The crewmen were strong but the storm was stronger. Their boat overturned, spilling them into the angry sea. Bobbing like corks, they grabbed the overturned boat, one at the front, one at the back, and held on for dear life. Among fishermen, there is a code. We take care of our own. Papa and Uncle Herbert had to rescue the two men. Together, they launched their own good boat and bent their backs into the oars, but the waves beat them back, slamming their boat into the, to the beach again and again. If Papa and Uncle Herbert couldn't make it to the boat, the crewmen would surely drown. A small group of fishermen gathered on the beach, knowing one of their own was in trouble. But what could they do to help? Was anyone big and strong and brave enough to plow through the waves? Papa had an idea and everyone agreed, the Frank horse. Papa was a big man, too big. He knew he would weigh down the horse. So he helped Mr. Gunther, a smaller man onto the horse's bare, broad back. Everyone knew the Frank horse loved the sea, but a horse can't hold its breath. If a big wave washed over the horse's head, he might drown. And these waves were as big as mountains. Would the horse dare to go into the water? But like the fisherman he served, this horse was huge in body and in heart. When he spied the shipwrecked men, he plunged into the lake. Head high, he snorted at the breakers as if they were nothing. He swam onward with his eyes on the men who needed help. From the beach, Lester watched one of the crewmen slip into the icy water and knew he was gone. Lester reached for Mama's hand for comfort. 
The horse was swimming faster now, racing for the man still clinging to the boat. At last, the Frank horse was there. The shivering man reached toward him, but he did not have the strength to climb onto the horse's bare back, slippery with rain. The horse knew what to do. He turned, offering his tail to the drowning crewman as a rope. Fingers numb with cold, the man held on as best he could, slipping but never letting go. The Frank horse pulled him through wild wind and water, wave after crashing wave, until they were, at last, safely on shore. Mama, already in the kitchen, had everything ready. She welcomed the stranger, his lips blue with cold and his face white as death, with a warm fire, blankets, hot coffee, and rum. And the Frank horse? He was returned to the warm stable, rubbed down and treated to an extra helping of oats. In time, Lester grew into a man, a man with a family, a fisherman, brave and strong, just like his father and grandfather. But he never forgot the story of the fisherman, the horse and the sea. The end. But then there's a nice back matter with wonderful things like this. It's the story after the story. This quote by Captain De La Smith, by gal, I dream about that Frank horse sometimes yet. Quotes like that, you can't make up. So we have information about the family with some photographs and uh, a wonderful illustration of the lake itself that gives you information about the lake and why it can be dangerous. And of course, the famous Smith Brothers fish shanty and um, a little bit of its story. So all of that, it's true Wisconsin story and, and reminds us of who we are, the fisherman, the horse, and the sea. But we also have available a discussion guide. Um, grab it for your classrooms. It's a really, really good discussion guide for classrooms. And we also have another uh, way to do crafts in the, in the classroom or just, just at home. Okay. Bye-bye.